Hello, this is your host, Todd Lewis, of the Braves of Folly podcast. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, and hit the notification bell. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter, Telegram, and Facebook. And support me on Subscribestar, Buy Me a Coffee, and Locals, all of which are in the description box below. So one of the themes that I've talked about fairly uh, frequently on this channel is the idea of the historical blackout, or the idea that history has been sort of taken over by corporate elements, elements that are in favor of a certain narrative of the U.S. Uh, and its empire and its wars, and the idea being that this is actually rooted in some direct event after World War II. Part of the declaration is in the 1947 Rockefeller Annual Report, but one of the, the first real uh, salvos by the historian Harry Elmer Barnes, who was considered in the first half of the 20th century, one of the more reputable historians. He tended to lean somewhat progressive economically, but also isolationist. And so his this, this will be a reading of the struggle against the historical blackout. The first of a two or three pamphlets he wrote on what was happening to historical profession of his own time. So we are going to start now. Note on revisionism then and now. One of the more notable contrasts in the intellectual atmosphere of today, as compared with that which followed the First World War, is the greater opposition to the dissemination of truth, which with respect to the causes of the Second World War. While the wartime mythology lasted for years after 1918, nevertheless, leading editors soon actually craved contributions which set forth the facts about the responsibility of the outbreak of war in 1914. Professor Sidney B. Fay began to establish his revolutionary articles on the cases, causes of the First World War in the American Historical Review in July 1920. Today, it is next to impossible to get any leading publishing house or any serious newspaper or a periodical to print anything which upsets the conventional fictions about the responsibility for the coming of war in September 1939 and for our entry in December 1941. My two brief contributions to neo-revisionism offered later on are symptomatic of the contrasting situation mentioned above. In 1924, the editors of the New Republic and the New York Times current history magazine veritably importuned me to write the article which first launched revisionism on any general or popular scale in the United States. In 1948, I prepared the review of Walter Miller's This is Pearl at request of one of our leading academic journals. I later submitted it to one of our best liberal periodicals. It was rejected by both, though it had been read and highly praised by the foremost American historical authority on Pearl Harbor and its antecedents. My comment on Lewis Mumford's resignation from the National Institute of Arts and Letters was submitted to the New York Herald Tribune, the New York Times, and the Chicago Tribune. The Herald Tribune did not even acknowledge its receipt. The Times declined to print it on the ground of a lack of space. The Chicago Tribune published it almost without change. The latter paper is virtually unique in opening its columns to neo-revisionist -revision, contributions today. Even at this time, it may be safely stated that the need for searching revisionist scholarship is overwhelmingly greater than after 1918 and that the results, if such scholarship is forthcoming, will be vastly more shocking to the American public than the materials published in the 1920s. Indeed, the little that has already been published on the Second World War is probably more dismaying than the totally, totality of revisionism relative to 1914 and 1917. But the difficulties in getting any truth published about the responsibility for World War II are all but insuperable. Although one important New York publisher brought out a veritable library of visionist books from 1925 and 1930. Virtually no leading commercial publisher will touch a book today which promises to tell the truth in this field, no matter how great the possible sales prospect. None of Dr. Beard's previous commercial publishers would have considered his book on the antecedents of Pearl Harbor, but he was able to turn to the courageous, friendly head of a university press. Mr. Morgenstern was compelled to publish his book through a small, fearless firm. Not all publishers are personally opposed to letting in the light, but even those who are friendly to neo-revisionism are in business to make money. Powerful pressure groups see it to see to it that publishers who deny the 
to file the ban on Neo Revisionist books meet with difficulty in marketing books through the usual outlets. The leading popular book clubs are controlled by the same pressure groups that operate the blackout and would never remotely consider distributing or recommending a book which departs from the accepted lore on world affairs and war responsibility. Even when such a book squeezes through the publishing ban, editors set in the review hatchet men from the smear bund immediately to work the murder of the book. Aside from reviews by Edwin M. Borchart, Harry Paxton Howard, and Admiral H.E. Yarnell, Morgenstern's brilliant book did not get one fair and honest review, and it appeared, and Professor George A. Lundberg found it impossible to locate an editor who would print his review until May 1948, thereby delaying its appearance until 18 months after the book was published. Despite his eminence in the historical profession as the Dean of American Histories, the same treatment has been accorded Dr. Beard by the hatchet men of the Smearbund. Even men who made their historical reputation in part by using Dr. Beard's personal historical materials have not hesitated to attempt to smear his book and his historical reputation. Indeed, the Blackout Boys have not rested content with smearing those who have sought to tell the truth about the causes of the Second World War. They now they have now advanced to the point where they are seeking to make to smear those who told the truth about the causes of the First World War. At the meeting of an American historical Association in Boston in December 1949, two papers were read that endeavored to undermine the established revisionist writings regarding the prelude to the conflict. Arthur M. Schlesinger Jr. has even gone so far as to attack those who have written in a revisionist tone on the causes of the Civil War. The next step will be to attack the revision of historical opinion relative to the causes of the American Revolution and find that after all, Bog Bill Thompson was right in his views of that conflict and his threat to throw George V into the Chicago Canal. In other words, revisionism, which only means bringing history into accordance with facts, now seems to be subjected by the blackout boys as a mortal sin against Cleo, the muse of their subject. The extent to which the determination to shut off the truth in this field has been has gone is revealed by the annual report of the Rockefeller Foundation for 1946, page 188, or it is frankly stated that a large sum of money has been granted to frustrate and check the rise of revisionism after World War II. There is to be a lavish subsidy, subsidized official history directed by men who played an important role in the propaganda and intelligence work of the British and American governments during the war. This is supposed to settle the matter for all time. Two, the ways of the blackout boys. The historical blackout of our day takes, as we shall see, several forms and manifests itself in a number of ways. But in all cases, there is a determined effort to evade the facts and logic of the situation. The reasons for the extent and veracity of the attempt to restrain and suppress the truth about responsibility for the World War II and our entry therein are obvious. The vested national interests of the last 15 years have their reputation deeply involved in maintaining intact the, faith, the myth of the superb ability and impeccable integrity of their chief, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And today, the maintenance of the Roosevelt myth is far more closely tied up with the wisdom and honor of Mr. Roosevelt's foreign policy than with the soundness of the New Deal social and economic program. This aspect of the matter is illustrated by the lyrical and delirious rhapsodies showered on the Roosevelt papers dealing with the war years, especially by Paul H. Douglas in the New York Times, February 19. 1950, and Henry Steele, commager in the New York Herald Tribune of the same date, and by the ludicrous, irresponsible, and grotesque whitewash of Pearl Harbor by Jonathan Daniels in the Aspirin Age. Moreover, many Republicans who detest the far more defensible New Deal domestic program have heatedly espoused the ardent internationalism and globaloni that led into war and the world into ruin or near ruin. Further, the interventionists who aided and abetted Mr. Roosevelt and his entourage in his war program must defend the wisdom and outcome of their warmongering. The special pressure groups which strove ardently for war must likewise justify their works, however calamitous the ultimate results for themselves and others. Finally, and very importantly, American leadership and policies were directly and deeply involved in the outbreak and the extension of World War II, which was conspicuously not the case in 1914. We had no guilt in cover-up in 1914. 
The revisionist controversies of the 1920s related chiefly to the deeds and policies of foreign countries and leaders. In addition to the opposition of public groups to the truth about responsibility for World War II, many of the professional historians and other social scientists have a vested interest in perpetuating the pre-war and wartime mythology. One reason why the historians very generally opposed the truth relative to responsibility for the First World War was that so many of them had taken an active part in the spreading the wartime propaganda and had also worked for Colonel House's committee in preparing material for peacemaking, some considerable number of them going to Paris with Mr. Wilson on his ill-fated adventure. Naturally, they were loath to admit that the enterprise in which they played so prominent a part was both a fraud and a flop. Today, the situation has been multiplied manyfold. Historians and other social scientists veritably swarmed into the various wartime agencies after 1940, especially the Office of War Information and Office of Strategic Services. They were intimately associated with the war effort and with the shaping of public opinion to conform to the thesis over the pure and limpid idealism and ethereal innocence of the United States and our sole and exclusive devotion to self-defense and world betterment through the sword. Hence the opposition of historians and social scientists to truth about war responsibility and obvious results of the war is many times greater today than it was in the years following the close of the First World War. Not since the decline of paganism and the rise of Christianity have there been so many powerful pressures pressure groups alerted against the discovery and expansion of truth and history, as is the situation today. How far this precautionary and provocative indictiveness can go is well illustrated by the current reaction to books by the author of this brochure. When his History of Western Civilization appeared in 1935, it was glowingly reviewed on the front pages of the New York Times, book magazine of the Herald Tribune Books, and the Saturday Review of Literature. The American Historical Review gave it a long and favorable review by the foremost American authority in the field. When his Society in Transition was published in 1839, the Times accorded it the unique honor of re reviewing a textbook on the first page of its book magazine. But when the author's survey of Western Civilization was published in 1947 and his Historical Sociology in 1948, none of the above-mentioned publications, so far as could be discovered, gave either of them so much as a book note. The author has been nothing has has written nothing on revisionist li, revisionism relative to the Second World War, except this slender brochure. Apparently, the movement has gone so far that authors are being suppressed or given silent treatment for fear that they might later on publish some little truth on world affairs. The author of this brochure was naturally suspect because of his writings on the First World War. The methods followed by the various interest groups in seeking to black out historical truth about world affairs since 1933 are numerous, but aside from subterranean persecutions of individuals, they fall mainly into the following patterns. One, ignoring or obscuring the material which is producing the unwelcome facts. Two, smearing the authors of books revealing such facts. Three, contending that whatever the devious deceptions practiced by Mr. Roosevelt and his supporters from 1937 to 1941 all of this was more than justified in the interest of veritable national self-preservation and for maintaining the successful deception of the populace is the cornerstone of sagacious statecraft under our system of government. They are all absolutely combined in Basil Rauch's Roosevelt from Munich to Pearl Harbor. The obscuring of the neo-revisionist material may be illustrated by the space and position assigned to the reviews of Charles Austin Beard's American Foreign Policy in the Making, 1932 to 1940, and George Morgenstern's Pearl Harbor in the American Historical Review, and in leading newspapers and periodicals. Despite the revolutionary nature and vast importance of the Beard book, it was given only a single page in the American Historical Review, but amusingly enough, the reviewer used the brief space at his disposal to praise the book. This was not allowed to happen again. Though Morgenstern's book was perhaps the most important single volume published in the field of American history in the year 1947, it was relegated to a book note and was roundly smeared. Of all the book reviewing columnists in New York City papers, only one reviewed Morgenstern's book and he smeared it. The Saturday Review of Literature ignored it completely and so did most of the leading periodicals. Though many infinitely less important books from the standpoint of both timeliness and intrinsic merit of content received front page position therein, neither the Morgenstern book nor the Beard volume was given this place in the Saturday Sunday book review section of the Times or the Herald Tribune. 
This The same was strikingly true of Dr. Beard's book on President Roosevelt and the coming of the war in 1914, easily the most startling and exciting historical book which was written, which was published in the year 1948. Had these books ardently defended the Roosevelt legend, they would have assuredly have been assigned front page position. As Oswald Garrison Villard remarks of the first Beard volume, had it been a warm approval of Lefty R and his war methods, I will wager whatever press standing I have that it would have been featured on the first pages of the Herald Tribune books and the Times literary section and received unbounded praise from Walter Millis, Alan Nevins, and other similar axemen. The attributes of editors who seek to suppress public knowledge of neo-revisionist literature is well illustrated by an anecdote related by Mr. Villard. I myself rang up a magazine which some months previously had asked me to review a book for them and asked if they would accept another review from me. The answer was, yes, of course. What book had you in mind, I replied. Morgan Stern's Pearl Harbor. Oh, that's the new book attacking FDR on the war, isn't it? Yes. Well, how do you stand on it? I believe, since this book is based on the records of the Pearl Harbor Inquiry, he is right. Oh, we don't handle books of that type. It is against our policy to do so. While the paper and periodicals are close to neo-revisionist truth, they are, of course, wide open and eager for anything which continues the wartime mythology. If the authors of such mythology did not feel reasonably assured that answers to their articles cannot be published, it is unlikely that they would risk printing such an amazing whitewash as that by General Sherman Miles on Pearl Harbor and Retrospect in the Atlantic Monthly, July 1948, and Captain Samuel Elliott Morrison's Veeam and Attack on Beard in the August issue. Now, Captain Morrison is an able historian of nautical matters and a charming man personally, but his pretensions to anything like objectivity and weighing responsibility for World War II can hardly be sustained. In his foreword to Morrison's Battle of the Atlantic, the late James Forrestal let the cat out of the bag. He revealed that as early as 1942, Professor Morrison suggested to President Roosevelt that the kind of history of naval, naval operations during the war should be written and modestly offered his services to do the job so as to reflect proper credit upon the administration. Mr. Roosevelt and Secretary Frank Knox heartily agreed to this position, and Morrison was given a commission in the Naval Reserve to write the official history of naval operations of World War II. If Roosevelt and Knox were alive today, they would have no reason to regret their choice of a historian. But as a court historian and the hired man, however able, of Roosevelt and Knox, Captain Morrison's qualifications to take a bow to Von Ranke and pass judgment on the work of Beard, whom no administration or party was ever able to buy, are neither impressive nor convincing. The smearing device used almost universally in discrediting neo-revisionist books is a carryover of the propaganda strategy predicted by Charles Mitchelson and political technique and extended by Joseph Goebbels and John Roy Carlson, namely seeking to destroy the reputation of an opponent by associating him, however unfairly, with some odious quality, attitude, policy, or personalities even though this may have nothing to do with the vital facts in the situation. It is only a complex and skillful application of the old adage about giving a dog a bad name. This is an easy and facile procedure, for it all too often effectively disposes of an opponent without involving the onerous responsibility of facing the facts. The Black Isle Boys have not hesitated to maintain that the effort to tell the truth about responsibility for World War II was downright wicked. Professor Samuel Flagg, Bemis declares that such, a, such an excursion into intellectual integrity is a serious, unfortunate, deplorable. Since the Morgenstern book was the first to shake the foundations of the interventionist and wartime propaganda, and because Morgenstern is not a professional historian of long-time academic standing, his work was greeted with an avalanche of smears. Indeed, as we have pointed out above, virtually the only fair review of the Morgenstern volume was those by Professor Borchard, and Lundberg, Lundberg, Mr. Howard, and Admiral Yarnell. There are there was relative, there was rarely any effort whatever to wrestle with a vast array of facts and documentary evidence, which both Dr. Beard and Admiral Yarnell maintained bore out all of Morgenstern's essential statements and conclusions. Rather, he was greeted with an almost unrivaled volley of smears. Some reviewers rested content with pointing out that he is a young man and hence cannot be supposed to know much, even as even though the New York Times handed over to Arthur M. Schlesinger Jr., a much younger man, the responsibility for reviewing Dr. Beard's great book on President Roosevelt and the Coming of the War, 1941. 
Another reviewer asserted that all that needed to be said to refute and silence the book was to point out that Margaret Stern is employed by the Chicago Tribune. Others stressed the fact that he is only an amateur dabbling with documents without the training afforded by the Graduate Historical Seminar, though Morgenstern was an honor student of history at the University of Chicago. It was not emphasized that most of the professors who reviewed the book departed entirely from any seminar canons of research and criticism which they may have earlier mastered. Morgenstern surely worked out and wrote in closer conformity to von Ronka's expectations than his professional reviewers. Others sought to dispose of the book by stating that it was bitterly partisan, was composed in a state of blind anger, or written with unusual asperity, though it is actually the fact that Morgenstern is far less better angry or blinded than his reviewers. Indeed, the tone of his book is more one of earnest and practical humor and urbane satire than of indignation. Few books of this type have been freer of any taint of wrath and fury. The attitude of such reviewers is a good example of what the psychologists call the mechanism of projection. The reviewers attributed to Morgenstern the blind anger that they themselves felt when compelled to face the truth. In reviewing the book for the Infantry Journal, May 1947, Professor Harvey A. DeWeird declared that it was the most flagrant example of slander in history that has come to his attention in recent years, but he failed to make it clear that the uniqueness in the slanting of Morgenstern's book was that it was slanted towards the truth, something which was, and still is, quite unusual in historical writing on this theme. The most complete smearing of the Morgenstern book was performed by Walter Millis and the Herald Tribune books. Though with all the extensive space at his disposal, he made little serious effort to come to grips with the facts in the situation. Professor Gordon Craig Princeton, reviewing the book in the New York Times, February 9, 1947, held that the book was no more than the anti-Roosevelt mythology and completely unbelievable, though he ad adduced no relevant evidence in support of either of these assertions. One of the most remarkable attacks on the book was made by Professor Oron J. Hale in the Annals of American Academy, July 1947. After smearing the book with the charge of bitter partisanship and asserting that the author made only a fake parade of the externals of scholarship, Hale sought manfully but futilely to find serious errors in Morgan Stern's materials. He then concluded that all or most of these statements in the book are correct, but that the book as a whole is a great untruth. This reverses the line of the current apologists for the Roosevelt foreign policy, who now argue that most of Roosevelt's public statements thereon were untrue, but that the program as a whole was a great truth which exemplified the desirable procedure of the good officer, the conscientious public servant. Due to the fact that Dr. Beard was a trained and a venerable scholar, and hence obviously not a juvenile amateur in using historical documents, that he had a worldwide reputation as one of the most eminent and productive historians and political scientists the United States has ever produced, that he served as president of the American Political Science Association and the American Historical Association, and that he was awarded in 1948 the gold medal of the National Institute of Arts and Letters for the best historical work of the last decade. It required a little more gall and trepidation to apply the smear technique to him, and his two splendid books in American foreign policy. Yet Dr. Beard did not escape unscathed. Though his facts and objectivity cannot be validly challenged, as Professor Lewis Martin Sears points out in the American Historical Review, April 1947, pages 532, the volume under review is said to give annoyance to the followers of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. If that be true, their faith is scarcely founded upon a rock, for no more objective treatment could readily be conceived the author nowhere injects a personal opinion. Hence, the only feasible line of approach for critics lay in an assault upon Dr. Beard's attitude towards our entry into World War II and his standing as a historian. Any testimonials as to Beard's historic prowess are therefore a red flag to the smear bund bull. Only this consideration makes such things as Lewis Mumford's resignation from the National Institute of Arts and Letters or Dr. or Harry D. Gideon's exposition, explosion of the New York leader on June the 12th, 1948, it all explicable. The difficulty of attacking Dr. Beer on the basis of his standing as a historian has diverted much of the smear of him into the allegation that his work is invalidated and unreliable because he was an isolationist. The absurdity of this charge I shall deal with later on in my comments on Lewis Mumford. 
Dr. Beer did, from 1937 onward, courageously and insanely warn against the manner in which the Roosevelt policies were edging us into a foreign war against the will of the overwhelming masses of the American people in what was supposed to be a democratic system of government. Beard's stand may or may not have been wise, though the facts today overwhelmingly prove its soundness. But such an attitude has nothing whatever to do with any literal isolationism unless one defines isolationism as a chronic meddling abroad and unwavering and invariable support of our entry into an extant foreign war. I was present at conference on foreign affairs attended by about 40 leading savants. Most of them wrung their hands about the sorry state of the world today, but only two or three were frank and candid enough to discern and admit that the majority of the conditions which they were so dolorously deploring stem directly from the foreign policies of Franklin D. Roosevelt, from the Chicago Bridge speech of October 1937 to the Yalta Conference of early 1945. Dr. Beard was assailed for his isolation has been cultural lag by both the chairman and the chief participants. Participant for no earthly reason save his up, say that he opposed the policies which had led to the chaos over which the conference was holding the coroner's inquest, but with no intention of declaring it a homicide or seeking the culprit. They vented their spleen on the man who had advised against risking the ambuscade, which led to the murder. Indeed, the whole issue of isolationism and the epithet isolationist has been only a very effective phase of the smearing technique invented and applied by the interventionists between 1937 and Pearl Harbor. And so naively exposed and betrayed by Professor Walter Johnson in his book, The Battle Against Isolation. It is both vicious and silly to brand a person an isolationist merely because he opposes our entry into World War II. Personally, I oppose our entry with all the power at my command, just as vigorously as did Dr. Beard. But it happens that I also wrote one of the longest chapters in the first important book ever published in behalf of the League of Nations and have ever since supported any move or policy which seemed to me likely to promote international goodwill and world peace. Saying internationalism is one thing. It is something quite different to support entry into a war likely to ruin civilization, mainly to promote the political prospects of a domestic leader, however colorful and pleasing, to satisfy the neurotic compulsions of special interests, and to pull the chestnuts of foreign nations out of the fire. The preposterous character of the whole process of smearing via the method of alleging isolationism has been devastatingly revealed by Professor George A. Lundberg in his article on semantics and international relations in American Perspective, June the 12th, 1948, pages 127 to 132. Actually, the current vintage of isolationists, the global only crowd that have taken over our over-internationalism in this country since about 1936, have not served the cause of internationalism and peace. The internationalists of the earlier era, for whom I wrote and lectured from coast to coast for 20 years after 1918, were true believers in international goodwill and peace and worked to secure these objectives. The global only interventionist crowd, while prating about internationalism and peace, have done more than anybody else except the totalitarian dictators to promote nationalism and revive and direct the war spirit. They have created an unprecedented spirit of nationalism, militarism, and imperialism in the United States and have helped to provoke a similar development in Soviet Russia. While blatant nationalism was checked very temporarily in Germany and Italy, it has been stimulated elsewhere from England to Indonesia, the East Indies, and South Africa. The United Nations have suddenly become more nationalistic and less united, and, more, and the world trembles and shivers on the brink of the Third World War before the peace treaties have been negotiated to conclude the second. There is all too much truth in the statement of an eminent publicist that Alger Hiss's long-continued and admitted activities as an aggressive internationalist did far more harm to the United States than the handling, handing over of any number of secret State Department documents, which he could have transcribed and transmitted to the Russians. Through Catholic circles, though, though Catholic circles have been unusually fair in tolerating the truth about the causes of World War II, the pressure on the editors was so great that even the enlightened Commonwealth permitted Mason Way to smear Dr. Beard in its columns. But the most irresponsible attempt to smear Dr. Beard as an isolationist came with almost uniquely bad taste from the pen of Harry D. Gideonsi, who reviewed Dr. Beard's President Roosevelt in the Coming of War, 1941, and the new leader, June 12, 1948. Dr. Beard was a native born American 
who had labored mightily for some 50 years to improve many phases of American intellectual and public life. No American historian, past or present, had a more honorable record as an active and effective intellectual patriot. He had never written a word which placed the interests of other nations above those of our country. Mr. Guyanese, on the other hand, is a Dutch-born, surely an honorary paternity, an honorable paternity, but there's little evidence that he has ever become completely immersed in Americanism or has taken on a thoroughly American point of view. In his public statements over many years, he has always given evidence of a robust internationalism which has little primary regard for American institutions or precedents. His internationalism appears to have a twofold basis. A hangover of the, of the Dutch imperialism of the Dutch East India Company tycoons of the 17th and 18th centuries and the virus of current American global owning. Anyhow, it has paid off remarkably well for Gideon C. was summoned from Chicago to Columbia University and then to the amazement even of his friends, suddenly catapulted into the presidency of Brooklyn College in 1939. Well, Gideon C. finds other non-factual grounds for assaulting Dr. Beard, he holds that Beard's alleged isolationism is all that is needed to brush the book aside. Indeed, all that is required for that is the fact, as Gideon C. tells us twice, in the course of his review, that it has been praised as a very great book by the isolationist Chicago Tribune. It might be cogently observed that the Tribune has also praised the Bible, Shakespeare's work, and Einstein's writing on relativity. But Gideon C. has not laughed this off as yet. If praise by the Chicago Tribune was not enough to destroy the validity of Dr. Beard's book, then in relatively... Sorry, then in Gideon C.'s view, it would be amply disposed of the fact that he often quotes even relatively sparing statements by eminent isolationists like Senator Burton, K. Wheeler, and Gerald P. Nye. Not even the fact which Gideon C. concedes. And he also cites Eleanor Roosevelt frequently and with respect can redeem Dr. Beard after he revealed any acquaintance with the effusions of allegedly nefarious isolationist personalities. Though, as we have made clear, reviewers have naturally been a trifle hesitant and daring to minimize Dr. Beard's status as a historian. Walter Millis and Kitty N.C. have not been dismayed or sidetracked even here. In his review of Dr. Beard's President Roosevelt and the Coming of the War in 1941 on the Herald Tribune Books, April 11, 1948, Millis contend, contended that Beard is not entitled to rank as an objective historian, according to academic fictions, but really belongs back with Fatalian, Orusia, St. Bernard, and other Dark Age exemplars of the devil theory of history. But it remained for Gideon C. to sail in and seek to divest Dr. Beard of all the claims to any standing as a historical scholar. Just why Gideon C. should presume to pass on questions of historiography into great, history, into great historians is not quite evident, though he has been doing so for many years. Professionally, though, admittedly a very talented classroom order and an effective rabble-rouser of the student body, he was also on a somewhat obscure economist when he strode into Flatbush with his mace. But Gideon C. does not hesitate to administer a sharp slap to the member of the American Historical Association who elected Beard to their presidency in 1933 by poo-pooing the general scholarly opinion that Beard was the dean of living American historians. This notion and pretense as Gideon C. is purely fictitious. Actually, according to Gideon C., Beard has only been a lifelong political pamphleteer in his books on Roosevelt's foreign policy or cheap journalism. In light of all this, one could read with considerable amusement, sardonic humor, an announcement in the New York Times of September the 8th, 1948, that Gideon C. opened the college year at Flatbush with an address to entertain entering freshman, in which he gravely and strongly asserted that truthfulness is a main and indisputable qualification of a college teacher, one which does not perhaps extend to college presidents. There were many other attacks on Beard's last two great books. They usually took on one of two forms. The first were efforts to dis dispose of them by brief and casual, jovial, and flippant smears without giving any attention whatever to the facts or meeting the arguments of the books. Such were Arthur M. Schlesinger Jr. smear in the Partisan Review, implying that Beard sought to justify collaboration with the Nazis. Max 
learner slurred to the effect that they were two rather weird affairs. Mr. Percy Miller's description of them as two frenetic indictments of Mr. Roosevelt, implying if Miller knew the meaning of the word he was using, that beard must have been insane. Peter Levins tossing them off as old hat, anti-Rooseveltarian mud, or Quincy Wright's ever brighter disposition of them as a strange arrangement, strange presumably to Wright, and that the arguments were based on facts. The other type of approach has been to smother the book under a vast welter of side issues, non sequiturs and irrelevant scoldings. This was well illustrated by the procedure of Charles C. Griffin, an expert on Latin American history who was selected to review Beard's last book for the American Historical Review, January 1949. He buried the book under four and a half pages of impenetrable, irrelevant, and dis disapproving fog, rarely coming to grips with the essential facts and arguments. Now, the only fair and scholarly review that the book received was by the chief authority in the field, Professor Charles C. Tansel in the Mississippi Valley Historical Review, December 1948, pages 53, 532 to 534. We shall reserve for later and more elaborate edition of this brochure an analysis and description of the howlings of the jackals and the hyenas around the body of the dead lion, and especially obscene performance which followed Dr. Beard's death and this is well exemplified by the articles of Max Lerner of All Persons in the New Republic, October the 25th and November the 1st, 1948, of Percy Miller in the Nation, September the 25th, 1948, and Peter Levin in Tomorrow, March 1949. In addition to smearing and obscuring neo-revisionism and neo-revisionists, the shock troops of the historical blackout fall back upon the assertion that whatever the numerous descriptions and public immorality of Mr. Roosevelt's foreign policy, all this is trivial and beside the point because it was a matter of national self-preservation for the United States to enter the Second World War and crush Hitler before the Nazi blitzkrieg engulfed us. One recalls Mr. Roosevelt's fearsome reference to Hitler's timetable to invade Iowa. The official talk about the ease of invading the United States via Dakar and Brazil Though such a movement of troops and supplies would have compelled the Nazis to traverse about three times the distance from Berlin to New York, and about the frequent discovery of secret Nazi plans for the invasion of the United States, despite the fact that the Nazis were not able to cross the less than 20 miles of the Dover Strait when Britain was virtually helpless, Professor Samuel Flagg Bemis of Yale University has described the American situation in 1941 as the most awful danger that ever confront, confronted our nation. And Walter Lippmann has written of our mortal peril at this time. Even such documentary material as has been appeared, as has already appeared, most of it official, has completely blasted the myth that Hitler had even the most remote notion of invading the United States at any predictable period. George, General George C. Marshall, in his official report as chief of staff at the end of the war, clearly stated that the Nazis had no actual plan of world domination. Indeed, he says, they did not have any plan for effective collaboration with the other two members of the Axis. In fact, they had no good long-range program for the best deployment and utilization of Nazi military forces to conquer Europe. Marshall further confirmed this in this disposition for use in the Tokyo trials. Further information to the same effect is contained by the Nuremberg and other or revelations rel relative to Hitler's order to the Nazi Navy and in the documents of the Nazi-Soviet relations released by our government in 1948-49. More precise is the information contained in an official report to the Secretary of the Army on Foreign Logistic Organizations and Methods, submitted in October 1947 and summarized in an article on the mobilization of German economic reserves in May-June 1948, issue of the Quartermaster Review by Colonel A.G. Texley. This material shows that the German economic program and military organization we laid out only for short and decisive campaigns on one front at a time, and all fronts to be in Europe or North Africa. Germany was not even prepared to conduct the war she actually had to wage with Russia. Hitler expected a short whirlwind victory. There was nothing in the German military program which remotely envisioned an invasion of the United States, even in the advent of a German victory in Europe. The lack of German economic preparation for any war of world conquest or even for a long European war is documented in detail by Dr. Burton Klein in an article on Germany's preparations for war, a re-examination, in the American Economic Review, March 1948. Indeed, in the years prior to 1939, Germany did not spend much more of her national income for preparedness than France and Britain, which have been commonly regarded 
as almost criminally negligent in respect to war preparations before 1939. Hence, the whole silly notion of the most awful danger and mortal peril falls apart completely. Not only did we have nothing to fear in the way of Nazi invasion, but the situation in Europe and the world situation today would in all probability be far more favorable for us if we had kept out of the conflict. Hitler could not have destroyed Russia. The two great totalitarian powers would have bled each other white and would have maintained some balance of power in the old world. There would have been no such economic chaos in Europe as there is today and no need for the Marshall Plan or the more than $25 billion we have futilely poured into Europe since VJ Day. Likewise, in the Far East, Japan would have retained power to checkmate Russian expansion and the growth of communism in that vast region. Now we have raised Russia to a position of complete dominion in the old world, destroyed for generations any balance of power, and brought about a situation where we can check Russian expansion only by a third world war, which will finish off what remains of civilization. There is little basis for the current hysterical fear of Russian aggression, but Surely Russia is stronger than Nazi Germany could ever have become and has far more robust plans for further expansion of territory and hegemony. Further, our entry into war was an ultimately possible the victory of the Chinese communists adding 400 million Orientals as Soviet satellites. With the possibility about tens of millions more in Southeastern Asia may fall into the same orbit. The Nuremberg trials made it certain that the Third World War will be waged with an unprecedented savagery. Akin to the argument for national self-preservation and even more of a hollow sham is the charge that revisionism after the First World War lost the fruits of peace and promoted the rise of Hitler. And that neo-revisionism of today will lose the presence of peace and probably bring on a greater and worse Hitler. This is the argument developed at length by Professor Bemis in his review of Morgenstern's book in the Journal of Modern History, March 1947. Here he states that revisionism after the First World War lost the peace of Versailles and assisted the rise of Hitler to power and its onslaught on Western civilization. Then he goes on to ask, will the new revisionism help to lose the second peace as the first revisionism helped to lose the first peace? One could counter this argument at once by asking Professor Bemis what peace there is today that the revisionists or anybody else could help to lose. But we will pass this by and consider the issue of revisionism, Hitler and peace, since Professor Bemis is a man of normal mental equipment and was alive and active in the 1920s, he cannot help knowing that his above-quoted assertions are a complete misstatement of the facts and are precisely contrary to the truth. The fact is that such revisionist scholars as had any interest beyond establishing historical truth sought to get a decent revision of the Treaty of Versailles and allied pacts primarily so as to assure justice for the conquered nations and to prevent the rise of Hitler or anyone like him. I made this crystal clear in all my writings on responsibility for the First World War, and so did all the other revisionists who made any effort to indicate the practical implications of their writings. It was the historians and public figures who rejected the facts and relentlessly refused adequately to modify the harsh post-war treaties who helped to lose the peace after the First World War and to bring in Hitler to rev revise the treaties by bluster, threat, and force. And the writers, publicists, and public figures who are today trying to black out the facts relative to the responsibility for World War II and its consequences are the persons who are getting the world ready for the Third World War, world chaos, and the inevitable triumph of world communism if any considerable number of people survive the war. The most active group in this field of endeavor is an organization which, with characteristic brazenness, designates itself as the Society for the Preservation of World War III, though, it's, though it might more accurately be called the Society for the Inevitable Assurance of World War III and of a Russian victory therein, and operates behind such respectable fronts as Mark von Doren, but the active forces are the same old war horses who espouse doctrines similar or capable to those of Dr. Richard Bruckner, who imply that the German nation must be exterminated because it is incurably warlike. Edgar Ansel Maurer, L. M. Burkhead, Louis Neiser, William L. Shire, Schreier, Rex Stout, William B. Ziff, Clifton Utley, and the like. In their publications, they follow the line of Lord Vanzetart, Paul Winkler, and others of their stripe who contend that Germany has launched most of the wars in Western history since the days of Tacitus and Arminius. They not only attack and smear authors who seek to throw some light of truth in the past and correct history, but also assail governmental measures which might restore the continental economy and policy of the West of Russia and make it an effective block against Russian expansion in this area. Any civilized attitude towards Germany 
And the post-war period, such as that recommended in Freda Utley's High Cost of Vengeance, is especially anathema to them. The following readily accessible facts espouse the hollow sham and their whole frame of reference. There have been two outstanding studies of the frequency of wars in modern times and the degree of participation of the leading nation, nation's hysteria. Part two of volume three of Pitram Sorskin's Social and Cultural Dynamics in chapter nine, volume one of Quincy Wright's A Study of War. Both of these authors are, relative, are rather intensely anti-German and vehemently interventionist. Let us see how well they bear out Van Zetard's persistent obsession that Germany is the mother of war. Covering the period from the 12th century to 1925, Sorkin presents the following list of percentages of total war studied in which the leading nations have been at war. Country and percent of years at war. Spain, 67. Poland, 58. England, 56. France, 50. Russia, 46. Holland, 44. Italy, 36. Germany, 28. As Sorokin concludes, the figures show that Germany has had the smallest and Spain the largest percentage of years with war. Of all the nations politically and militarily important in recent times, Van Zetart's own England stands at the head of the list of warlike activities. Even Holland, the mother of peace, has, has participated in war far more frequently than Germany. In his efforts to estimate the relative bellicosity of leading countries, Professor Wright details with a period from 1948 to, from 1480 to 1940, he finds that there were some 278 wars involving the European countries during this period. The percentage of participation by the principal states is as follows. This shows that in modern times, England has been out in front in point of a relative bellicosity among the nations, while Germany and the Netherlands stand at the bottom of the list, next to Denmark. Even this list by Professor Wright does not reveal the full responsibility of England for wars in modern times. For it has been the wise and shrewd policy of British diplomacy to get other nations to fight Britain's wars when possible. We now come to the fourth and final line of defense of the shock troops of the blackout the Army, Navy, and Congressional Report on Pearl Harbor, Morgan Stern's book, and particularly Dr. Beard's volume on President Roosevelt and the coming of war in 1941, have made it impossible any longer to deny the fact that, as Claire Booth Luch put it in the Republican National Convention of 1944, President Roosevelt led us into war. So instead of continuing the former argument for the unswerving integrity and veracity of the chief, the defenders of the Roosevelt legend now take the line that, sure, President Roosevelt lied about his foreign policy, but just think of what a noble cause he lied for. This line of defense has been developed, among others, by Arthur M. Schlesinger Jr., Robert E. Sherwood, Gideon C., Henry Steele, Cominger, Paul H. Douglas, and Professor Thomas A. Bailey. The latter states the idea most clearly and succinctly on pages 11 and 12 of his Man of the Street, 1948. Franklin Roosevelt repeatedly deceived the American people during the period before Pearl Harbor when he warned them against the aggressors he was branded a, a sensationalist. When he pointed to the perils of storm cellar neutrality, he was branded as an interventionist. When he argued adequate, when he urged adequate armaments, he was branded a warmonger. He was faced with a terrible dilemma. If he let the people slumber in a fog of isolation, they might fall prey to Hitler. If he came out unequivocally for intervention, he would be defeated in 1940 or shelved for a candidate more willing to let the masses enjoy the fool's parade. Paradise. If he was going to induce the people to move at all, he would have to trick them into acting for the best interests of what he could save to be their best interests. He was like the physician who was a lot of the patient for the patient's own good. Congresswoman Clara Booth Luch misses the point entirely when she violently charged in the campaign of 1944 that Roosevelt led us into war because he did not have the political courage to lead us into it. The latter course would have been foolhardy rather than courageous. The country was overwhelmingly non-interventionist to the very day of Pearl Harbor, and an overt attempt to lead the people into war would have resulted in certain failure and almost certain ousting of Roosevelt in 1940, with a consequent defeat for his ultimate aims. In his vastly popular wrestlings with the wraith of Harry Hopkins, Sherwood appears to vindicate and approve the political lie as a sound technique of statecraft. Admitting that President Roosevelt would probably have been impeached if the public and Congress had known the truth about his foreign intrigues, the main requirement is the Machiavellian test, namely that he must succeed. In other words, it must be plausible enough to be accepted by the people at election time. 
One is reminded here of Hitler's famous eulogy of the lie in a political strategy and of the classical statement, the classic statement that if a lie is big enough, it is very likely to succeed. Well borne out by the prob probability, well borne out by probability, the greatest and most successful political lie in all history. Winston Churchill's whopper gave us the tools and we'll finish them off, made when Britain stood alone against Hitler's mighty military might. This put over Lend Lease when the finishing off came American troops actively in battle against the Nazis outnumbered the British by more than 10 to 1. We may illustrate the technique and ethics of the political lie as utilized by President Roosevelt in the conduct of foreign affairs by reference to perhaps the most dramatic and crucial case of all. On September the 7th, or September the 2nd, 1940, a secret agreement was reached with Great Britain by the terms of which we gave Britain 50 destroyers and received a 99-year lease of naval and air bases from Newfoundland to British Guiana. An official conference of government lawyers was held at which it was fully agreed and conceded that this act put the United States into the war, both legally and morally. One of the ablest lawyers present cynically but cogently observed that times and methods had changed. In olden times, when war was decided upon, a herald was sent out on a white horse and with a trumpet to announce the news to the populace. But now when war was determined upon, the fact supporting documents were locked in a safe and the people were assured that the war was more remote than ever. There has been much debate as to when we actually entered the war. At the time of giving the English musicians after, munitions after Dunkirk, at the time we stripped our air defenses for Britain, at the time of the destroyer deal, when convoying was begun in the spring of 1941, at the time of the embargo on Japan in July 1941, or after Pearl Harbor. The fact is that the top circles in official Washington had decided we were in the war when the destroyer deal was constant consummated. Two months later, President Roosevelt was declaring in his campaign speech in Boston, and while I am talking to you mothers and fathers, I give you one more assurance. I have said this before, but I shall say it again and again and again. Your boys are not going to be sent into any foreign wars. Indeed, we actually committed flagrant acts of war when we gave the British a vast quantity of military materials immediately after Dunkirk. And when we stripped our airplane defenses to send planes to Britain, the act which led Secretary of War Harry H. Woodring as a patriotic public servant to resign in protest. In the full knowledge of all of this, Judge Robert H. Jackson, who as Attorney General in 1940 put the rubber stamp of legal approval upon the ignoring of Congress, and this decisive destroyer ruse which put our country into the war, could later go with a straight face to Nuremberg and demand the death penalty for the Nazi leaders because of their aggressive policies and deception of the German people. Even if we accept the thesis that Mr. Roosevelt lied for a great and noble cause, including self-preservation, this idea of executive leadership via deception, and contrary to the will of the people, raises a serious issue relative to the democratic government. The concentration of an irresponsible Fuhrer deceiving his people, even for their own good, would have received a hearty approval from Hitler and is the essence of the totalitarian technique of in foreign policy exactly what we were supposed to be fighting against in the late war. Not only Hitler or Stalin, but also a monarch like Louis XIV would have warmly commended this procedure and diplomatic ethic. And all of this goes to show how far totalitarian ideals permeated the ranks of those who are ostensibly organizing our power and battle and morale to battle against Nazism. But the nobility of the cause is speedily fading out. The cornerstone of the cause, national self-preservation, is now a crumbled illusion. Roosevelt himself admitted that the Atlantic Charter was a synthetic fraud and quasi-forgery. None of the four freedoms has been realized, and the situation in regard to most of them is worse than before 19, 1939. There is neither freedom, peace, nor plenty, but intolerance, censorship, wrangling, warmongering, frantic and lavish military outlays in preparation for World War III and worldwide hunger, starvation, and disease. The United Nations was already in a worse state of disintegration before the cornerstone had ever been laid for its headquarters. And the League of Nations was as late as the Ethiopian debacle. There is no space here to elaborate on the sorry theme of the utter collapse of Mr. Roosevelt's ostensible war program. But such human events letters as those by Henry Preston, April 19, 1947, and October 29, 1947, by Felix Morley, May 21, 1947, August 13, 1947, October 1st, 1947, March 24, 1948, and May 12, 1948, by William Henry Chamberlain, April 16, 1947, October 22, 1947, 
December 17, 1947, and June 30, 1948, and by Edna Lonigan, January 1, 1947. Amply uphold and establish the unwelcome and disheartening thesis that the noble cause for which Mr. Roosevelt is admitted to have lied so profusely is as much a fiction as the earlier dogma of his unimpeachable veracity. For the present sorry state of the world with civilization hanging in the balance, we have to thank more than anyone else Mr. Roosevelt's policies of Casablanca, Tehran, Quebec, and Yalta. All of this is set forth with the devastating force in Mr. Chamberlain's forthcoming book on the Second Crusade. William Newman's Making the Peace tells us how he lost the peace. Indeed, there is fairly conclusive evidence drawn from authentic captured Polish documents, Roosevelt's assurances to Anthony Eden on his visit to Washington in December 1938, his statement to Edward Benz at Hyde Park in May 1939, that the United States would surely enter any European war against Hitler, what we know of the Tyler Kent case and the like, that, be but for Mr. Roosevelt's pressure on Britain, France, and Poland and his commitments to them before September 1939, especially to Britain, and the irresponsible antics of his agent provocateur, William C. Bullitt, there would probably have been no war, World War in 1939, or perhaps for many years thereafter. Further, Professor Hans Rothfeld's book on German opposition to Hitler in 1948 and A.W. Dulles's Germany's Underground in 1947, revealing Roosevelt's adamant refusal to have anything whatever to do with the German underground forces taken together with the utterly ruthless, irresponsible, and disastrous Casablanca unconditional surrender program afford good ground for believing that Mr. Roosevelt was only incidentally interested in speedily overthrowing Hitler, but was more concerned with provoking, entering, and prolonging a war, which would add to his personal luster and prolong his tenure of political power. The same assumption is borne out by the Japanese situation because President Roosevelt had in his hands before he left for Yalta much the same Japanese terms of peace which we would accept in August 1945, this was before several of the bloodiest engagements in the Pacific and over six months before the atomizing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. At Yalta, Roosevelt made incredible concessions to Stalin with respect to both Europe and the Far East in order to induce Stalin to declare war on Japan. Though Roosevelt knew at the time that Japan craved peace as a beaten nation and there was not the slightest need for Russian intervention to crush Japan. It will be interesting to await the next readout, which will be thrown up by the Blackout Boys, other than to step up the traditional program of slander, intimidation, and persecution by the smear bun. It may take the line adopted by Edmund Blair Bollies in the review of Dr. Beard's book in the New Republic of January the, July the 5th, 1948, namely that it is unfair to attack Mr. Roosevelt, whatever the extent of his dissembling, for he would have been bound to end the war no matter who was president. For we would have been bound to end the war no matter who was president. There is little doubt that we would have entered the war if Wendell Wilkie had been elected president, for he admitted when testifying on Len Lease that all his opposition to war during the campaign of 1940 was only deceptive campaign oratory. But there's little reason to believe that we would have entered the war if Robert A. Taft had been elected president. Taft was virtually offered the Republican nomination by the same personalities and forces which later put over Wilkie if he would sell out to the seaboard interventionists and Anglophile interests. This, as a good patriot, Senator Taft refused to do. The thesis that we cannot elect a president who will put the interests of the country ahead of his personal political ambitions in the importuning of pressure groups at home and suppl supplicant for nations is an assertion that I am still too old-fashioned and optimistic to accept. Instead, the example of President Hoover disproves the argument. In January 1932, Secretary of State Henry L. Stimson openly played as Lucifer Hand in Far Eastern diplomacy. He took Hoover to the mountaintop and even... If he did not promise him all the kingdoms of the world, he did make it evident that Mr. Hoover could recoup his political fortunes and have every prospect of re-election in the autumn if he would make war on Japan. But Hoover would have nothing to do with the idea. A year later, Mr. Stimson had rendezvoused with Mr. Roosevelt's newly elected successor at Hyde Park and had no difficulty in selling his bill of goods. From that time onward, Mr. Roosevelt had an ace in the hole whenever he needed a foreign war to rehabilitate his political prospects at home. He played the ace in the summer and autumn of 1941. Some of the some idea of the factors, forces, pressure groups, and person, personnel responsible for restraining the publication and discussion of the truths with respect to the cause of the Second World War, as well as the methods employed by the shock troops to blackout, can be attained from John T. Flynn's brochure, The Smear Terror, obtainable from the author, 15 East 40th Street, New York City. From the concluding pages of my chapter on the 20th century American historians, 
In the book of the 20th Century America, edited by Joseph J. Ruick and published by Philosophical Library, New York, 1950, from Dr. John H. Sachs' booklet on hatchet men, obtainable from Lincoln Way Booklets, New York, New Oxford, Adams Country, Pennsylvania, and from Oswald G. Villard's article on book burning U.S. style and the progressive, April 28, 1947, most of these blackout organizations are offshoots, affiliates, or post-war successors of the War Writers Board, and was presided over by, by Rex Todd Hunter Stout, a writer of detective stories whose claims to competence in historical matters equal those of a dishwasher, and a Bowery restaurant to a mastery of hydraulic engineering. It has been contended by some readers of earlier editions of this brochure that there is really no conspiracy to prevent the truth from being known about the responsibility for the Second World War, and it's just a matter of honest difference of opinion. Nobody who has been through the reactions and techniques employed by the opponents of revisionism in both world wars can take this argument seriously. There was some smearing in the 1920s, and there is some honest difference of opinion today. But the situation is a difference in kind as well as degree. In the 1920s, editors and books, publishers welcomed revisionist opinions, articles and books, even though they might criticize them. Revisionism was attacked by counter-argument and at least alleged facts. Not even so devious a sophist as Bernadette Schmidt would have tried to toss off Sidney Fay's work as two weird volumes, nor would even such diehards as William Stearns Davis, Charles Donner Hazen, Frank Malloy, Anderson, or E. Raymond Turner would have dared to dispose of Charles C. Tansel's volume as a frantic attack on Woodrow Wilson. There was a fairly wholesome give and take in revisionism in the 1920s, and it was rare that a person's character and heredity were impeachable because of his views on 1914 and 1917. Michelson, Goebbels, Winchell, Carlson, and others have not yet perfected the smear technique, and some of the more powerful pressure groups now conspiring to prevent the disclosure of truth were then the most ardent and powerful supporters of revisionism. Further, and this is very important, in the 1920s, writers on the war responsibility were mainly expressing opinions on the deeds and motives of foreign statement publicists and scholars. Their opponents of revision in the 1920s had no need to lie and smear to cover up their own delinquencies and mendacity in regard to the causes and conduct of the First World War. The reverse is the true today. There are few of the apologists or members of the present smear bunch who did not have some responsibility for bringing on the war, for directing or lauding it, for publicly for public lying during the war, or for general generating and dismantling the wartime mythology. All right. That's all. Let's try out the chat today. We've got Mutant 12, Corbin, and Mr. Maverickism. Hello. Uh, let's see. Mutant number 12. I've never heard of this book. Again, you show your true power level. Thank you. Mr. Maverickism. Nice. Been loving these series. Well, great. I, I hope these series are successful and more people tune into them. This is Todd Lewis, the President of Flood Podcast, signing off.